I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 to 26 this evening on this subject, getting a handle. You may be wondering, what does 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 14 to 26 have to do with getting a handle? And I hope to unpack that for you in the next few moments. Uh, If you would, please stand with me as we pay honor to the reading of God's word. I I don't intend to read all of these verses in our first reading this evening, just from verse 14 to verse 19, but we'll look at these verses in totality this evening. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, this is the word of the Lord. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about Words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. May God bless the reading of his holy inspired inerrant word and write its eternal truths onto our hearts. Let's pray together this evening. Father, we come to you tonight to a text that is uber important for the life of every individual Christian. The temptation when we study books like First and Second Timothy and Titus is to say these are classified as the pastoral epistles so they only apply to the preachers. But God, you have inspired all of scripture and you've given it to us all collectively so that we might learn and grow. So help us to be attentive tonight to listen to what your word has to say, what we know not teach us, where we need to grow, grow us for your glory and our good. We ask these things in the name of Christ, amen. You can be seated. I love the phrase, help people get a handle on this. Help people get a handle on this. You know, there are just some areas of life where we need help understanding what we are supposed to do. Maybe we need help understanding where we're supposed to go or how we're supposed to live. That's just a basic, common fact of life. And the truth of the matter this evening is that there are subject matters in which you and I need to get a handle on them, especially for our own life, but especially also if we're gonna be instructing others. I realized the other day that I am closer to one of my greatest fears than I've ever been. I realized the other day with Harper becoming closer and closer to becoming a kindergartner, the fear of having to help my kids with their math homework. (laughs) Praise God for parents who loved me and tried their best to help me to understand math. I was suitable or good with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. I did times tables by rote memory. I still think there's a value to some rote memory thing. How in the world would I know that nine times nine equals 81? Just by sheer memory, not because I'm talented mathematically. But then came algebra and geometry and trigonometry and calculus. And I gotta be transparent with you this this evening. I'm not even sure that I took the last two that I just listed in high school because I'm pretty sure I just blocked it out of my brain. I'm just, I did not know it at the time, but as I, as the Lord had called me into vocational ministry, he was going to give me a word, a theological word about algebra, that algebra 
despite what my fellow faculty member at Mission University, Steve Maurice, would love you to think that algebra is ordained and orchestrated by God, I make on our campus regularly the argument that algebra is indeed evidence of the fall. (laughs) Because numbers and letters do not belong together in mathematical equations. (laughs) They were in two separate fields, walking along peaceably, and then Eve ate, And Adam took also, and the next thing those brothers knew, they were in math problems together, wondering, what are you doing here? And the, the, the letter said to the number, I was wondering the same thing. No matter what it seemed like, I could never get a handle on those subject materials. Now, there is something far greater than not being able to get a handle on math, and that is not getting a handle on what it means to be a Christian. Paul instructs Timothy to charge and remind the Christians in Ephesus to do things in a certain way. In other words, he's helping them get a handle on the aspects of being a Christian. And so tonight in our time together, what I want to do is I just wanna simply put before you three categories of things that Christians must have a handle on. Now, they're not... These are guideposts along the way and applications as well. They are not uh, comprehensive as the points are, but you're gonna see, I think they serve as great guideposts to helping us take a text like 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 and be able to walk away with some sort of structured arrangement for how we should think on these things. So I want you to see, number one tonight, that what is necessary for the pastors to do in the life of a local church is to help Christians, number one, get a handle on the word. Verse 14, I draw your attention there again. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Here in these opening verses, Paul tells Timothy to remind and charge the people at Ephesus. One of Timothy's main responsibilities as the pastor in Ephesus is to encourage people and challenge them. He is to encourage them and challenge them. It's a charge to remind them of these things and to charge them. If you're looking for your pastor to be your best friend, to put his arm around you and constantly encourage you, can I just give you a word? Go get a golden retriever. Now, I'm not saying that the pastor should be in your face all the time, but... We are living in a culture and a society where we have undercut pastors' abilities to remind their people and to charge their people lest they offend those people because they suggest that there is something wrong with the way that they are living. And so Paul tells Timothy, this is why you have, a, a, this is why you have an older pastor writing to a younger pastor, This is why the older saint needs to encourage the younger saint. This is why in Titus, Paul's gonna tell Titus, have the older men teach the younger men. Have the older women teach the younger women. Why? Because when you're young, you're fearful. Sure, we talk about the arrogance of youth, right? Your kids, those of you who are parenting or in... If you have teenagers, you're navigating a hostage negotiation situation all the time. (laughs) Love to give off the idea that they know everything. Not one hour and a half ago, my four-year-old stood in my office and told me, I know everything. (laughs) 
Well, in light of that, good luck. (laughs) But the truth of the matter is, if most young pastors were honest, if you were able to see inside of what happens to us, you would know that sometimes we read a we, those of us who are committed to, to Bible exposition, you know, you preach one text, then you preach the next text. Sometimes you get assigned a particular text as a young guy, and you're going, I wonder if there's somebody who wants to switch this week. Because this is not what people want to hear. Paul's going to have, you're going to hear Paul come back to this, I charge you, Timothy language as we go deeper in this book, specifically in chapter four, he's going to charge Timothy about his task as the pastor. And we don't wanna preach that sermon until we get this one done. So suffice it to say, Timothy needs encouragement to remind the people and to charge the people. But of what? Well, really the first area of this charge revolves around the word of God. He instructs Timothy to make sure the people know how to use the proper words. He says to them, charge them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of their hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved. You're gonna have to forgive me. A years of Awana and this thematic verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, the authorized version says. So Paul is not being a grammarian trying to tell them don't end your sentences with a preposition. Use whom when speaking of personal people, not who. I had that type of English instructor in high school. Not who, but whom. Okay, but who are you talking about? You know, I just wanted to provoke her to love and good works. He wants the church in Ephesus to to make sure they're grounding their speech in the proper words. What words should they be? They should be the word of God. Rather than getting caught up in words of foolishness, they are to rightly divide the word of truth. Or a real stronger way of maybe of saying this, to cut it straight to clear the forest and make a path, but not a path with their own thoughts, not a path with their own thinking, not a path with their own opinions, but a path that is driven by the word of God. Implicit in this call is to rightly divide the word of truth, is the need to know the word. A Christian cannot rightly divide what they don't know. You will not cut it straight if you're not acquainted with its content. It's a fundamental conviction. I've told this story before lots of places, so I'm assuming that I've told it here, but I remember being in Bible college and the first paper that I ever had to write came from this book, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I wrote, I wrote that paper. I thought I, got, I should have gotten a better grade on it than I did. I've reflected on that, and I still hold that position. But I remember as a 19-year-old third semester Bible college student walking out that fall, at the end of that fall semester with that study on the doctrine of the Bible and the doctrine of, of God, his character, his attributes, the Trinity, and thinking to myself, well, now to the really fun stuff. You know, you live in Southwest Missouri, so we've got to deal with this issue of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and the miraculous gifts of this age. That's going to be a battle that we're gonna have to fight and you know, get to the doctrine of salvation. We're gonna have to, certainly we're gonna have to have a discussion 
probably robustly about Calvinism at some point. And thinking as a 19-year-old kid, we've got that doctrine tucked away, we're fine. Let's move on. Because certainly, we're all in agreement about that. 15 years removed, what do I find myself constantly having to go to battle over alongside of our pastoral staff? Do you believe in an inspired, infallible, inerrant Bible? It turns out that the first battle is going to be the battle that we continue to fight in every era. And the problem in our culture and our society today is there are a lot of people who want to tell you that they're preaching God's word when they're rubbing up against it. I've told my students that what we call this type of preaching, I call it sparkling water preaching. You say, why do you call it sparkling water preaching? If you've ever drank sparkling water, I remember a few years ago we started to drink sparkling water and I was intrigued by it. I still am intrigued by it. I still drink it. I don't really know why, but I do. And uh, they came out with this brand of water. And I think it was, it, was a great, uh, it was a great name for it. They called it Hint Water. Because in Hint Water, what happens is they get sparkling water and they put it in a bottle. And they put it in a room. And then they get a case of strawberries and they set it next to that bottle water. Three months, six months, nine months, I don't know. I'm not even sure that this is really what they do. It's what I like to think because there is an essence of strawberry in this sparkling water. It is not strawberry. If you've ever drank this sparkling water that is flavored, they're like, here's lime sparkling water. It's, it's carbonated water with a hint of flavor of lime or of strawberry or of watermelon. It is not, I've had grape soda. This is not grape sparkling water. You can't fool me. I am not tricked by you people. And yet, here I am continuing to drink it. I don't know what that says about me, but I do know what it says about preaching. There's a lot of preaching and teaching today that is sparkling water preaching. You listen to it, and there's just a touch of the Bible. It rubs up against the Bible. It comes close to the Bible. It brushes shoulders with the Bible. It kind of maybe quotes the Bible, but it is not preaching that is grounded in the Bible. The the Bible isn't driving it. And then you wonder why there's people who don't know what they believe because nobody showed them from the scriptures what they should believe. So Paul's telling Timothy, you've got to help these people to know that they need to be able, not the preacher. Because in my prayer, my opening prayer, I was specific. I was praying, asking the Lord for help, but I was trying to teach you too at the same time, trying to, trying to multitask a little bit there in the prayer. We go pastoral epistles, people are like, oh, this is implied to me. This is for preachers. No, and yes. Yes, it is for us, but it's also for you. Paul doesn't tell Timothy to remind you, Timothy. He says, remind them. They've got to be able to do it. And the, the call here, verse 16, but, pro, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. What the call here is, is to banish from their conversation, not arguments, but false theology. The profane and idle babblings point to the Ephesian heresy and the danger that lied in it. We, we see that fleshed out in verse 17 as Hymenaeus and Philetus are specifically listed as false teachers. They had taught the heresy that the resurrection had already happened. They were making the argument that believers experience the full reality of Christ's resurrection already in the present. Meaning, You're like, what does that mean, right? Meaning they were receiving this argument that there's no future glorification to come, that right now you've been perfected. Well, that's dangerous. You say, why is it dangerous? Well, have you spent 10 minutes with yourself? You think this is the best perfection that Christ can do in your life? Think about my own life. 
Doesn't seem that powerful. If this is perfect, we've got a problem. But Paul says to Timothy, call out these false teachers and banish them from the conversation. We, it's not a call to not have arguments. On the contrary, it's to call arguments for what they are and not try and make some sort of backdoor, well, you know, they're trying their best. The most severe issue in this text is that it had led to the faith of some people being damaged. One commentator says this, in this text, there is a figurative extension of the term that indicates a spiritual destruction of a person's faith in Christ. The term means to jeopardize someone's inner well-being and even to ruin them. Paul could not be any clearer about the serious nature of this particular bit of false teaching. Paul says, get it out of the church. You don't discuss it as an alternative theology. You call it for what it is and you get it out of the building. We're not playing around with false teaching. We're not... We're not messing around with redefining what God's word has to say. We're going to remove it. And if we're going to be guilty of any name it and claim it theology, it's going to be naming and claiming the false teachers. And and forgive me if this is too strong. We're going to claim the scruff of their necks and show them the exit. I promise you, I promise you, given the character and nature of our staff and given the character and nature of our pastor, that kind of teaching will not be tolerated here. I I promise you, we have covenanted together that if one of us makes shipwreck of our faith while we're preaching, that the others will get up and leave and we will leave loudly. I ain't sticking around to duke it out with nobody about false teaching. I ain't got time to waste my life trying to convince someone who's in error that they're in error. I've got to name that for what it is and then either they've got to go or I've got to go. You're like, that's pretty strong. False, look, you make a mistake as a doctor, you put that body in the grave. You start putting out false teaching. You start playing with people's souls and where they're gonna spend eternity. This is real life theology. And we don't play around with it. Which is why number two, Paul tells Timothy, make sure these Christians get a handle on their condition. Look at verse number 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Paul here, in moving forward, presses Timothy to remind them about the reality of people's condition before God. In the church, if there are those who are struggling, they are to be reminded that the Lord knows who belong to him. He knows who are his, and that what they're supposed to do is to pursue lives of holiness. That's a second phrase in the end of 19. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In the church, if there are those who are struggling, they're to be reminded that the Lord knows who they belong to. The reminder here is that God knows how to tell the difference between those who are his people and those who are not. And Timothy must be able to do the same. 
He and the congregation must be able to distinguish the sheep from the wolves. That's the call here. Timothy and the congregation will have to call out false teaching for what it is and stand apart from it. They cannot let it cohabitate in the life of the church. Because Paul's already said it spreads like cancer. This is a part of the teaching of the scriptures that is most neglected today. Churches are worrying about offending someone who has a relative that goes to a church that teaches false doctrine than actually teaching that there are false teachers. When error comes to your town, or let me put it this way, when terror comes to your town, if terrorists show up in your town, you don't lay down and tell them, well, we have differences of opinion, but let's just get along. False theology, false doctrine doesn't come looking for friends. It is not Dale Carnegie. It is not here to win friends and influence people. It is there as an instrument to accomplish, Paul's gonna say in verse 26 of this text, to accomplish the will of Satan that Satan and his demons send forward false teaching as a way to distract, to disengage, to entangle, to detract people from true knowledge of who God is. That's the whole reason why false theology exists. It's not just a different way of thinking about things. It is a means by which to ensnare people to hell. And so when it comes to our town, we don't just say, well, that's just a different way of thinking. It is of the pit of Satan and it ought to be rebuked. There is a right and a proper way to do this. Some of you are like, wow, this this is feeling rather strong this evening. There's a right and a proper way to do this. I don't think we have to be mean. I don't think you have to be nasty. I don't think you have to cut jokes. I don't think you have to put people down. I don't think you have to be over the top. We just, I'm a big fan of of 12th century apologists. And you say, why are you a big fan of 12th century apologists? Because 12th century apologists basically did this. Greg comes onto the scene. Greg's teaching something false. The 12th century apologist doesn't come up with a catchy title for his book like, Something I don't know what you would come as a crafty title for a book. They didn't do that in the 12th century. They wrote a book and they, they said this, against Greg and his heresies. Here's his name. Here's his false teaching. Here's why it's wrong. They weren't rude. They weren't cruel. They weren't over the top. They weren't slick. They weren't trying to market anybody. They just said, here is the false teacher and the heresies that they're teaching. It's as simple as that. And people were like, well, we can't do that. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, apparently Paul, the apostle Paul, writing under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, didn't really give a rip about offending people because he names names. He says, hey, hey, you in there in Ephesus, avoid false teaching. Like, who's teaching false teaching? Hymenaeus and Philetus. Oh, yeah, I've seen those brothers around. Yeah, they're in error. Get them out away from the people of God. The simple truth is that as God has entrusted Timothy to shepherd the flock in Ephesus, he's also called Timothy to shepherd and protect that flock. In my office, if you were to walk down to my office, there are two uh, cartoon drawings by a man named Paul Cox. He's a, an illustrator who lives in, in the, in the, Saint Louis, or the uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area of Minnesota. And they, they hang side by side so that I see them while I'm working. One of them is a quote by Knox, John Knox, who pastored in Scotland. And he, it said, I've never once feel, feared the devil or his armies, but I tremble every time I enter into the pulpit. Meaning this task is serious, bots. You've gotta be serious about this. You've been entrusted by Pastor Eddie to preach to these people. That is not a light task. So you better get yourself prepared because this isn't your pulpit. It's God's pulpit first and then it's Eddie Bumper's pulpit second. So this isn't for you to fool around with and be cute and do a shtick. 
teach the Bible because that's what your pastor has modeled to you for the last 14 years. So you better make sure. So that's enough to keep me trembling. And then right next to it is a quote from Calvin who pastored in Geneva. He said the pastor must have two voices, one to gather the sheep and one to drive away wolves. I'll tell you this, sheep, I love you. Wolves and goats, don't be messing with my people because they're not mine. They're God's. And then the chief under shepherd of this church, Eddie Bumpers, has entrusted me to be extra muscle. And I'm playing for keeps. This is not a game to me. I have watched churches be torn to shreds by false teaching. I watched and lived, I lived on a dorm floor in college where a pastor's son from the Kansas City area, that pastor had amassed a church larger than this congregation. And years ago, he stepped up into his pulpit on a, on a Sunday and began to teach the people that hell is not real. And error ripped that church apart. It's not a game. It's not a game. There's an eternal condition of people's lives at stake tonight. You say, why does, why does Crossway Baptist Church, why does Eddie Bumpers, why does the staff at Crossway take God's word so seriously? Because we know in the course of our lifetimes, and we've watched it here in other places, that the only thing that is effective to change people's lives is God's word. So when you start messing with it, we've got problems. The hopeful news. Now, just a little drive-by teaching here. You're like, how can you do more drive-by teaching? Well, we'll just see if we can do this, thread this needle. Now, verse 20, but in that great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Now, here's where some not good theology comes in sometimes. Some people will point to this verse and say, see, God predestines some for heaven, others for hell, vessels for honor, vessels for dishonor. Boom, case closed. Only elect are vessels for honor, only the non-elect are vessels for dishonor. They're frozen and they're chosen in their places and nothing that you can do about that will change it. Right, provided that you don't keep reading your Bible. So just as a side note here in our, our conversation this evening, it's really important that you don't let your theology get stuck in a text, right? You're like, I've got it. No, keep reading. Because here's what Paul says. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, being a, a vessel for dishonor, he'll be sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. So that's why we keep preaching and teaching the scriptures. Because we've got some right now in this room tonight and watching online, we got vessels that are, are fit for honor. We got some vessels that are fit for dishonor. And we keep teaching and we keep preaching and we keep calling people to repent and be saved and, and to be reconciled to God. Why? Because we want those vessels that are built for dishonor to become vessels of honor. We want them to become sanctified. We want them to become vessels that are fit, that are useful in the hands of the almighty creator. That's why I'm gonna keep on preaching and singing, right? And telling folks about Jesus because we wanna see a move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's what motivates us. That's that evangelistic fervor that you can't get the Great Commission outside of your bones. Once you're a Christian, it seeps down inside of you because as you see the lives transformed, you can't help but say, let's go get some more. You can't but help but get excited. We've got yet a whole nother point to go. Paul tells Titus, Make sure they have a handle on the word. Make sure they have a handle on their condition. And then make sure they have a handle on their work. Much like the women on Easter Sunday morning, I must make haste here. Verse 22, flee also, also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Pay careful attention to what Paul is going to say next. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Sometimes we just think the devil's just out there just messing with people. He's got a will that he's trying to accomplish and it's contrary in direct opposition to God's word. What is our work? Not what is the pastor's work, but what is the Christian's work? Flee youthful lust, flee youthful desires. This is the idea of my desires have to be reoriented. I can't desire what I used to desire. I've got to desire what God wants me to desire. His desires have to become my desires. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Why will he give you the desires of your heart? Because you've delighted in him so that his desires are now your desires. And he's now getting, you're like, I get the desires of my heart, which God's like, yes, because those are my desires. So we, we flee those youthful lusts, but we per, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We also are gonna avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Some of the biggest issues inside of churches is fussing over stuff that is insignificant, unimportant for the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God under the guise of that's my conviction or that's my theological outtake. Brother, sister in Christ, with all the love and care and compassion in my heart, show me the text. No text, no big level Discussion. You're going to try and get me to engage in that. I'm just going to say you don't have a text, or in my argumentation, a leg to stand on. So I'm going to love you anyway. Like with my preference. Wonderful. I understand your preferences. We all have things that we like and things that we don't like. I, you know, my preference would be everybody in this church would become a St. Louis Cardinals fan. My preference would be everybody in this church become an Iowa Hawkeye fan. My preference would be that everybody in this church love Chinese food as much as me. I, my preference is that every Wednesday night we all go to Andy's and somebody else buy my ice cream. That's my preference. <laughs> but we're not going to break fellowship And rightfully so. Look, I've gone through enough pain being an Iowa Hawkeye fan. Why do I need to bring you along with me? I've suffered enough for the collective group. Why would I? I love you too much to let you do that. We cannot afford to fuss. And Look, the devil is looking for any way possible. I hear pastors say this regularly. The devil is looking for any way possible to drive a wedge in our unity. So he starts with the pastor and his wife. And if he can't get them... Then he starts working on the staff's relationships with their spouses and their family. And if he can't get that, then he starts working on the staff and uh, their interpersonal relationships in the office. And if he can't get that, then he starts fussing with the deacons. And if he can't get them, then he goes to the Bible fellowship teachers. And if he can't get them, then he goes to whoever is considered to be influential in the community to get them. Because what he's trying to do is breed disunity. And disunity happens when we're fussing about stuff that doesn't matter. Which is why we've got to learn, and this is tough, we've got to learn to be gentle. We've got to learn to be able to teach. Later in this book, Paul's going to tell Timothy to exhort them with all long suffering. In other words, Timothy, when you preach to those people in Ephesus, you be patient with them. Not just a little bit, but all the time. This is the most difficult thing to do. Just like my parents sitting at the table trying to help me not be able to understand math is the pastor who's trying to help people grow in godliness that just can't get it. And he's supposed to have patience. So y'all should be praying for each other and for the staff. And it's most importantly for our pastor that we would have patience, that we would be able to know how to humbly correct people. Why? Why? so that they may come to know the truth and that knowing the truth that will set them free, they'll be able to escape the snare of the devil. If people, Spurgeon said, are to go to hell, let them go to hell, climbing out of our clinging, grasping arms 
trying to bring them back to the truth of God's word. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. If you have more questions, or maybe you're that person who's looking to take their next step in their walk with Christ, we would love nothing more than to connect with you through our website. For service times and information about other events and activities at Crossway, you can connect with us at crosswaybc.org. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We hope to see you again soon.